So our theme last week, and again this week, and again next week, is this phrase, isn't he worthy? And uh, if you have the handout, you'll see that's what we're going to talk about today. Jesus is worthy. Anybody in the room bought a big ticket item lately? A house, a car, a motorcycle, a boat, anything like that. Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Yep. Did you get a good deal? No? Oh, (laughs) I'm sorry to hear that. How do we measure whether it's a good deal or not? Well, basically, if you determine it's worth this much and you paid that much or less, that's, that's a good deal. Yeah. If it's worth this much and you paid more than that, not such a good deal. Yeah, you want to balance the scale, right? Well, here's an interesting thing. Just this week, uh, I learned that the Greek word translated worthy in the New Testament is a word that literally means to balance the scale. And the reason is because in ancient times, uh, value was measured by weight. They didn't have paper money. They had, they had uh, metal currencies, and those currencies weren't all the same weight. And so you put things on a balance scale to determine its worth. Jesus is worthy. And today what we're going to do is something a little different. We're going to put Jesus on one side of that balance scale. And then we're going to talk about what it would look like to live our lives in such a way that we try to balance the scale. And I'll just say right up front, I'm going to come back to this. But there's no way we'll ever balance the scale. But the Apostle Paul actually calls us to try. He says, I want you to live your life in a way that's worthy of the gospel, that's worthy of the God who saved you. So that's what we're going to talk about today, living a life that balances the scale. Uh, But we're going to start, you can see we've got two things on your outline there, that Jesus is worthy and Jesus is worth it. In the first half, we're going to just talk about Jesus, get a fresh look at who he is, how worthy he is, how amazing he is. We're going to look at it from Revelation chapter 5, a place in the Bible that we don't often go. The book of Revelation. And so if you want to pass the Bibles down the aisles, would you do that right now? Pass the Bibles down the aisle and turn to Revelation 5, page 1065, near the very back of the Bible. And here's the big idea. We're going to see that Jesus is better than you thought. Whatever you think of Jesus, he is much more. Whatever you think of Jesus... He is much more. He's more powerful, more loving, more gracious, more wise, more good than you could ever imagine. Jesus is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, will redeem all things. He is right in everything he does, perfectly just, perfectly loving toward all he's made. He is light, John says, and in him is no darkness at all. Whatever you think of Jesus, he is much, much more. Jesus is is worthy. So that's where we're going to start today. Number one in your outline, Jesus is worthy. Would you say that with me, please? Jesus is worthy. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, Jesus is worthy. All right. And we're in Revelation chapter 5, page 1065. Now, just a little bit of background about the book of Revelation. Uh, The book of Revelation was written by the apostle John late in his life, near the end of the first century. He was in exile from the Roman government. They'd sent him to the Isle of Patmos. And there, in exile, God gives John a vision of what's to come, of the future. And John wrote this vision down in a specific form. It's called apocalyptic literature. And uh, this particular type of literature uh, is really heavy on symbolism, uses lots of very vivid symbols. And there are many symbols in Revelation that are difficult to interpret. And here's how I like to picture it. Imagine someone 500 years from now looking at our political cartoons. Okay, let me just give you an example. I'll throw one up on the screen here. Here's a political cartoon. Imagine someone 500 years from now looking at that going, what in the world was going on? They've got a talking elephant and a talking donkey wearing clothes and backpacks and talking about what they did on summer break. What does that mean? Now, you look at it and you know right away what it means, right? What do the animals stand for? Yeah, the Democratic and Republican parties, right? We see that. But 500 years from now, will people understand what that means? Not unless they know our history and our context. Otherwise, it would just look like a crazy cartoon. That's what reading the book of Revelation is like. The people in John's day understood the symbols he was using. He used, if you will, the political cartoons of his day. And they understood when he was talking about Rome and Rome's power and Caesar. We read it 
20 centuries later, and oftentimes are left scratching our heads unless we take the time to do the research and understand the background and the context. So that's a little bit about Revelation. So some things, like I said, are difficult to understand. Some things are quite obvious and clear, and we're going to see that as we read here in Revelation chapter 5. So in this opening vision, John is taken to heaven where he sees God sitting on his throne And God is surrounded by four living creatures, each of them with a different face, all of them covered with eyes, and 24 elders, and they sing this song together. We'll put it on the screen, and I'm going to ask you to read it aloud with me. Revelation 4, verse 11. Ready? All together. Here we go. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. God is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. Why? He created all things, right, he, and he sustains all things. Uh, Paul said in Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have our being. He's the creator, the sustainer. He's worthy. Now, who are the four living creatures? Don't know. And scholars have all kinds of guesses on this, but we don't know. Some think that they're the highest form of angels. Others think that they represent all of the created order, that that's the meaning of the different faces. What we do know about them is that they are constantly around God's throne proclaiming his praise because he is worthy. Next question, who are the 24 elders? And again, the answer is... We don't know. Scholars have actually listed 13 different possibilities of what these 24 elders might be. They could also be angels, or they could represent the saints of the Old and New Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 apostles of the New Testament. Again, what we do know is that these 24 elders are also constantly around God's throne, worshiping him, you are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy, they say. So that's the scene in heaven. And it continues right on into chapter 5. So let's pick it up at verse 1, chapter 5. And here's what John writes. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. All right, so here's this picture. God's on his throne in heaven and in an open hand, that's the picture there, His hand is open, and there sits a scroll that he's holding out. Now, what is in the scroll? Well, we know from reading the rest of Revelation that it's nothing less than the destiny of the world. It's the consummation of all human history. It's all that's going to happen in our world and to all of us. How many of you would like to see that? About six of you. Okay, fantastic. Well, John wanted to see it very, very desperately and was weeping because no one was worthy. Hey, here's one thing I want you to notice that's really beautiful in this symbolism. Who holds the destiny of the world in his hand? God does. God does. Why was that important? Because in John's day, who did they think held the destiny of the world? Caesar. Caesar. And in our day, people think it's Putin or Biden or Trump, and it's none of them. It's God who holds the destiny of the world in his hand. He is worthy. He is worthy. That's what we have to remember. So John wants to see what's in the scroll. But an angel said, who's worthy to open it? And no one could be found. And John weeps and weeps. It's a loud wailing. And finally the elder says, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able. Yes, he says, there is one who's worthy. It's the lion who's worthy. And who's the lion? The right answer in church, friends. It's Jesus who's the lion of Judah. Jesus is worthy. And then John turns to see the lion, and here's what happens next, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Let's pause right there. 
So John turns to see the lion, and what does he say, see instead? A lamb. Jesus is called the Lion of Judah only this one time in the book of Revelation. In all the rest of the book, he's the lamb. 29 times, he's the lamb. And this picture of the lamb looks all the way back to the Passover when a perfect lamb was slain. And its blood marked the homes of the Israelites and spared them from death. And Jesus is that perfect sacrificial lamb who gave his life for us. The lamb has been slain. But where is he standing? Did you notice? He's standing in the center of the throne with God. Christ shares the throne with God as his divine equal. Not two thrones, but a single throne with two equal figures on it. Now it says the lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. And horns were a symbol of power, and eyes were a symbol of knowledge, and seven was a number of perfection or completion all through this book. And so what John is saying, again, in symbolic terms, he's saying the lamb is all-powerful and all-knowing. And when he takes the, the scroll from God, God authorizes the lamb to execute his plan for the world. God's plan to save the world happens through the agency of the slain lamb. Jesus is worthy. And look what happens next, verse 8. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one of them had a harp. They were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Pause for a moment. What you just did when you prayed for someone, those prayers are being heard in heaven, friends. There's a golden bowl that holds all the prayers, and they're rising like incense before God the Father. Take those notes home and pray this week, would you? And let the incense rise. And they sang a new song, verse 9, saying, you are worthy, there it is again, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. All right, so here's this picture in heaven again. When Jesus takes the scroll, when the lamb takes the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders all fall down before him and they break out in song. And what's the song again? You are worthy. You are worthy. Jesus is worthy. Why? This time it's not because he created, although that's true. This time it's because you were slain and with your blood you redeemed people for God from every tribe and people and language and nation. The slain lamb is worthy. He's worthy of our worship and praise because he gave his life to redeem us. Friends, the cross was no accident and Jesus was no martyr. It was God's plan from the very beginning to redeem us. In the center of the throne, at the very heart of God's plan for us, is a slain lamb. And everyone around him is crying, you are worthy. Then verse 11, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Quick, what's the math? 10,000 times 10,000? 100 million, give or take a few million. 100 million angels, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice, they were saying, what? Worthy, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. This first song sung by the four living creatures and the 24 elders starts an avalanche of praise. After the four and the 24, then it says the angels join in. How many angels? A hundred million. I mean, again, did John sit there and count the angels? No. What he's saying is, this is a multitude so large no one could number it. A hundred million angels join the song, worthy is the lamb. Jesus is worthy, they're singing. Worthy of what? The simple answer is, everything. They pile up seven phrases. Remember, seven is the number of what? Completion or perfection. Jesus is worthy of everything. All power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. Jesus is worthy. Worthy of everything they're singing. But that's just the start of the avalanche. Because next it says every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them join in. Every creature in the universe joins the song. 
All dogs and cats, lions and tigers, bears and elephants, birds and fish, bugs and critters, all 2.13 million species on the planet, and every creature in the entire universe joins in the song to whom? To him who sits on the throne, that's God, and to the Lamb, Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of all the praise and glory and honor and power that every creature in the universe will offer him. It's a staggering scene, isn't it? Staggering. Whatever you think of Jesus, he's much more. Jesus is worthy. And so right now, friends, on our scale, the scale's tipped over here as far as it can go, isn't it? Jesus is worthy of everything. I thought about this. Uh, okay, true confession. So Lane and I are, are watching right now Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. <laughs> the movie. Yeah, yeah, we're watching it. And, and I tell you, uh, she is an amazing talent, and her concerts are a spectacle. They're, they're quite impressive. But early in the concert, she's out on stage, and after she sings the first song, she's talking with the crowd, and she just points around the arena. And as she points to each section of the arena, all the Swifties go crazy, right? I mean, they're just shouting their praise to her, as she, and, and she's just there soaking in the adulation and praise. And I thought, I mean, it's a very big moment right there. And I thought of that moment as I read this passage. And I realized that as amazing as that was, it was like a tiny drop in the bucket. Actually, more like one drop in the ocean on one small planet that's in a universe spinning with 700 quintillion planets. Did you know there are that many? One drop in all of that. That's what Taylor Swift's praise looked like in comparison to what Jesus will receive. When a hundred million angels and every creature in the universe rises and sings, you are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy, it's going to be awesome. Isn't it? It's going to be stunning. Whatever you think of Jesus, he's much more. Jesus is worthy. All right, get that vision of Jesus in your head. Here's the one we worship, worthy of everything that you can give, and that leads us to the second side of the equation, right? The second side of the scale. Now it's our turn. Number two in your outline, Jesus is worth it. So we have this amazing picture of Jesus receiving worship from every creature in the universe, everyone and everything, bowing down and singing, you are worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. And what's our response to that? What do we put on the scale over here? Our response is to join the song to give Jesus not just our praise and worship in a song, but to give Jesus our praise and worship with our lives, with our very best, with all that we have. Jesus is worth it. Whatever you give to Jesus, he's worth it. And more. We give Jesus our very best. He's worth it. So I'm going to tell some fun stories as we go along here. But I want to just unpack this idea of living a life worthy of the God who saved us, of Jesus who gave his best for us. In Malachi 1, last book of the Old Testament, I call him the Italian prophet Malachi, uh, In the very first chapter, God takes the Israelites to task for offering him blemished sacrifices. Right? So the Israelites had a, an elaborate system of sacrifice, offering animals to God as sacrifice. And God always required what kind of an animal? Perfect. Right. Yeah, God asked for their very best. Give me your best animal in sacrifice. Well, the Israelites were not giving God their best. They were giving... The animals that couldn't be sold at the marketplace, blind, lame, injured, diseased. And they were actually saying, this one, this one that won't sell at the market, this one is good enough for God. Ooh. And here's what the Lord says, Malachi 1.8. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Oof, yeah. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? God asked for and expected their best. Why? Because God is worth it. He's worth it. Are you giving God your best? Are you giving God your best in each area of your life? Uh, when I was a junior in high school, 
It was basketball season, so this story came to my mind. When I was a junior in high school, I was on the varsity basketball team, but i got to be honest with you, I wasn't getting many minutes. I was, I was sitting on the bench. I was riding the pine, as we like to say. And if any of you here have ever played competitive sports, you know that if, if you don't get to play, right, if you do all the practicing and you don't get to play, it's pretty discouraging. And i got to tell you, I'm just being honest, it was, I was tempted I was tempted in practice to coast. I was tempted, particularly if the coach wasn't watching, to just coast, not give my best. And one day, I was reading this passage, Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 22. Paul says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you. Not just when they're watching to curry their favor. But do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters or coaches. I put that, I put the parentheses in there myself. And it just hit me that God expected me to give my very best in practice, even though I wasn't going to get to play. Because I really wasn't playing for the coach, I was playing for the coach. Capital C, right? I realized that whatever I do, whatever I do, whether it's playing basketball or it was doing my homework or working at my job or later serving my spouse or loving my kids, whatever I do, I'm to do it for the Lord. And because I'm doing it for the Lord, I give my very best every time. Always, no blemished lambs. Never think, oh, this is good enough for God. Not unless it's your best. And why is that? Because Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth our best. Friends, one day we're going to stand before the throne and you and I will worship with every creature in the universe. We'll see Jesus as he is. And remember, he's always more than we think. But we'll see Jesus as he is. And friends, in that moment, I don't want to stand there with regret and think, why, why did I give him blemished lambs? Why didn't I give my best? Because we'll see then that Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. What's today, friends? What's Sunday? Palm Sunday, right, Palm Sunday, uh, this, it's the, the day that Jesus uh, made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and uh, that story, by the way, is told in Matthew 21, it's listed there in your outline. The crowds gather to welcome Jesus to Jerusalem, and he rides in on a donkey, and by doing that, he fulfills the ancient prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, and Matthew actually quotes this in verse 5, he says, say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. Why was this donkey significant? Because Jesus claimed to be their king, but a different kind of king. Most kings rode into town riding what? A war horse, right? They rode into town on a war horse, leading their troops armed for battle. But to ride in on a donkey was to make a statement. It's saying, I'm coming as a man of peace. The Jews were expecting a Messiah who would exercise military and political power and drive out the Romans. They were expecting a warrior. They were looking for this guy. we got a picture of him here. There he is. That's who they were expecting, right? That's a picture of their Messiah. Instead, they got this guy. It's coming. There he is. Do you see the contrast between the war horse and the donkey? Jesus was signaling he was not the kind of king they expected, but they didn't catch it. And so they rolled out the red carpet for their king. The crowd began laying their cloaks down in the road along with small branches, literally making a carpet for the king to ride in on. And they shouted their praises. I can just see them laying down their cloaks, and I imagine Mabel saying, Henry, what are you doing? That's your only cloak. You've only got one cloak. That donkey, all those people are going to walk on it. The donkey might even poop on it. They're going to ruin your cloak, Henry. And Henry said, Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. He's worth your cloak. He's worth your praises. He's worth your best. Jesus is worth it. That's why Paul wrote this, Ephesians 4.1. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. I want to go back to that balance scale, right? Get a picture here of the balance scale. And, of course, what makes the balance scale work is there's a pivot point right in the middle, right? And this verse I just read, Ephesians 4.1, is the pivot point in the whole book of Ephesians. This would be a worthwhile thing to do this week is just go back, read Ephesians, six chapters. 
And here's what you'll find. The first three chapters of Ephesians are all about Jesus and what he's done for us, right? It's that picture of the worth of Jesus. Here's what Jesus has done for us. The second three chapters are all about how we're to live in response to that, that what we do. And this is the pivot verse right here. He says, here's who Jesus is. Now I urge you to live a life worthy of that calling. Jesus is worth it. He's worth whatever you can do to put over here to live a life worthy of that calling. How many of you have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? Okay. Um, if you haven't seen it, let me just tell you, here's what it's about. It's about a soldier, Private Ryan, whose three brothers were all killed in action just before he scheduled to parachute into occupied France as part of the D-Day invasion in World War II. And Captain John Miller is assigned a platoon of soldiers and is ordered to go into occupied France, find Private Ryan, and bring him out so he can be returned to his parents alive. Most of Captain Miller's platoon dies completing their mission, including Captain Miller. And in a very moving scene, the dying captain clutches Private Ryan's shirt and he says, earn this. Earn this. They'd given their lives so that Private Ryan could live. What did Captain Miller mean when he said, earn this? What he meant was, he said, go live a life worthy of the sacrifice given for you. That's what he meant. And in the final scene in the movie, many years later, a much older Private Ryan visits Captain Miller's grave in France. And he's there weeping over this grave and he's wondering, did I live a life? that was worthy of the sacrifice made for me. And I think that scene, that's typical of how any of us would feel. If someone actually gave their lives so we could live, we'd think, I want to live a life that's worthy of that sacrifice. Now there is one big difference between what Captain Miller did and what Jesus did. Jesus never said, earn this. Jesus said, this is a gift. I'm doing this for you because I love you and because you can't earn it. And so please hear this, friends. This is very important. When I talk about balancing the scale, I'm not saying that we can earn our salvation. That's impossible. It's a gift from God. But precisely because it's a gift, in gratitude we offer our very best back to God. Will our lives ever be fully worthy of the sacrifice Jesus made? The answer is no. No, we can't do that. But that shouldn't stop us from wanting to be. Isn't that right? That shouldn't stop us from being motivated by a heart of gratitude that says, you gave everything for me, I want to give everything back to you. Live a life worthy of the one who called you. Jesus is worth it. Paul continues this same theme in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. He says, we are praying for you so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. So there he says it again. We're praying for you that you would live a life worthy of the Lord. Give him your best. Jesus is worth it. So when I was in Bible college, one of my favorite professors was Dr. Richardson. I admired him, still admire him. He's in heaven now. But in this one class, it was a New Testament class, and uh, I offered an opinion about a particular passage of scripture. And when I'd finished giving my opinion, Dr. Richardson rebuked me in front of the whole class. And he said, Mr. Whitwer, that's not worthy of you. I mean, you, you kind of suck the air right out of the room, right? Like, ooh. On the one hand, it stung, but on the other hand, I understood it was a compliment too. He was saying, you can do better than that. And you should. And it challenged me to make sure that I gave my best. And Paul's calling us to do the same. Live a life worthy of the Lord. Give your best in all that you do. All of life, everything we do is to be offered to God as an act of worship. To the God who gave his very best for us. I don't want to stand before the Lord one day and hear the Lord say that. Mr. Whitwer, that's not worthy of you. And it sure isn't worthy of Jesus. Instead, what I want to hear him say is, well done, good and faithful servant. Live a life worthy. Jesus is worth it. 
Paul says this again, Philippians 1.27. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. There's the whatever again. Whatever you do, whatever happens, whatever, live worthy of the gospel. Jesus is worth it. And one more verse. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, Paul says, We were encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Live lives worthy of God. Why? He's worth it. He's worth your best always. But just turn to your neighbor right now and tell him, Jesus is worth it. Would you? Tell him, Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. All right, I got one last story. Well, actually, I got one personal story, one Bible story. Here it is. We're coming in for a landing. Everyone okay? Okay. So my senior year in high school, um, I, was, I was student body president. I was class salutatorian. I finished second out of a class of 200. I had won some regional and national awards. And my advisor, my student advisor, Mr. Wenzel, uh, thought that I should go study law and go into politics, and he offered to help me get into some prestigious schools. And I told him that I was called to be a pastor, not a politician, that I was going to go to Northwest Christian College, this dinky little school in Eugene, not Stanford. And after trying to convince me over a period of several months, and I kept telling him, no, 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 finally he gave up. And you know what he said? He said, what a waste. What a waste. And my response, Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth anything I can give, up to and including my life. And I want to tell you, friends, I am so glad. I am, I love the life Jesus has given me as I've devoted myself to serving him and following him. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. Now, please hear me. This is very important. Please hear me. I'm not saying you need to be a pastor. Whatever, remember we read that passage? Whatever you do, it's whatever God calls, if God calls you to be a wife and a mother, be the best wife and mother you can be for the Lord's sake. If he calls you to be a father and a husband, be the best father and husband you can be for the Lord's sake. If he calls you to be a nurse or a doctor or a teacher or a truck driver, or if he calls you to be a politician, be the best at whatever God calls you to be for Jesus' sake. Because he's worth it. He's worth it. And it's a matter of calling. Be the best at what he calls you to be. But when George Wenzel said that to me, when he said, what a waste, it reminded me of a story, and I'll finish with this story from the Bible. It reminded me of the story of Jesus and Mary. Mary was Lazarus' sister. The story's told in Mark 14. And it's actually just days before Palm Sunday. So this is a fitting time to tell this story. Just days before Palm Sunday, Jesus was visiting Mary and Martha's home in Bethany, just outside Jerusalem. And only a few days before this, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And now Mary and Martha are hosting a dinner party. Jesus is the guest of honor. But I also think Lazarus might have been a fairly substantial attraction. I think people from around town thought, this would be interesting to go talk to this dude. What was that like, right? But here they are at the dinner party, and Jesus, uh, as I said, was the guest of honor. And Jesus, uh, Mary wanted to honor Jesus. And so she brought out a very expensive jar of perfume made of pure nard. Now, ladies, how many of you would buy a perfume named nard? (laughs) Okay, just, yeah, it's right, it just doesn't sound great. Right, like, oh, 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 what's that fragrance you're wearing? It's nard. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) So even though the name's a little odd, and you can see from the picture we still have it, even though the name's odd, this was top drawer stuff. Very, very expensive. In fact, we learned from the story that this single little jar or bottle of perfume was worth more than a year's wages. Yeah, I mean, that's staggering, isn't it? Think about one jar of perfume worth everything that you make in a year. It probably represented Mary's savings. Savings in those days were often in consumable goods. And Mary walks in with this bottle of perfume. She heads to Jesus, and everyone assumes that she's going to do what? That she's just going to put a couple drops on Jesus' head to honor him. That would have been plenty. 
Instead, she shocked everyone by breaking the neck of the jar. Because now there's no way to reseal it. And then she pours the entire jar of perfume, probably about 12 ounces worth, all over Jesus' head. <laughs> this, is a, this is a pretty shocking thing to do, isn't it? This was Mary's extravagant act of worship. Gave it all to Jesus, the whole jar, her whole savings. Why? Because Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. Now the fascinating thing is what was the disciples' response? Mark 14, 4. They said, what a waste. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. What a waste, they said. But Jesus said, verse 6, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. You can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus not only didn't think this was a waste, Jesus was so impressed that he memorialized Mary. Wherever the gospel is preached, he says, people are going to tell this story. Why? Because Jesus wanted us to see what Mary did and to understand that he's worth it. And we should do the same. Whatever we have, our very best. Whatever we do, our very best. We give to Jesus because he's worth it. And I want you to notice that Jesus said, Mary poured the perfume out to prepare my body for burial. In other words, Mary knew what Jesus was about to do. She knew that Jesus was about to go into Jerusalem where he wouldn't sit on a throne, but would hang on a cross and give his life for all of us. And so Mary poured out her life savings on Jesus, not just because he raised her brother, but because she knew that Jesus was about to give his life for her and for you and for me. Jesus is worth it, isn't he? Jesus is worth it. And this brings us back full circle. This is why everyone in Revelation sings, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And why Paul then could write, live a life worthy of Jesus who gave his everything for you. Friends, Jesus is worth it, isn't he? Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Jesus, you are always so much more, so much more than what we know. Lord, would you fill our hearts with this vision of the Lamb who was slain, and then out of gratitude and grace, send us this week to live lives that are worthy of the Lamb. We pray that together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.